do not understand this argument. It makes no fucking sense to me. Shut up. Okay. Look. Look. Listen. Seriously. Fuck ones and zeros. Utter bullshit. Fuck ones and zeros. Utter bullshit. Okay. Look. Look. Okay. Look. Look. I do not under. I do not under. I do. I do. I do understand this argument. Understand this argument. Understand this. Utter bullshit. It makes no fucking sense to me. It makes no fucking ones and zeros. 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 First note, I was told that it's going to be warmer in a couple of minutes or at least in the next hour. Uh, I don't know for you, but I am warm enough inside and uh, with all the stress, though, I don't really need any more heating, but I will do anything for you guys. Um, next mo, thanks to them for sponsoring the, I, I keep on thinking about seeing the podcast or the show. Uh, sponsoring the conference. Um, if you happen to do anything which has to do with sending e um, SMSs, messages uh, over uh, a gazillion number of devices, you want to go with those guys. Uh, they're amazing. Check them. Nexmo.com. All right. The next one is Eric. Yeah, right. Dot notation or no? Oh boy. Did he start something last year when he was a when he was a um, Asking the question, he, he asked the qu the question, and um, yeah, and then we all know where it, it led. Um, he's going to speak about security. I've shown some of his slide, and I can tell you, it will definitely kick your butt if you're not secure about security. Um, I'm sure he's going to throw some flame. Um, and actually, uh, now it, it would be your time, as the audience, to ask him one of those flame questions, like. Um, what do you think about ones and zeros? Um, <laughs> but I am going to mention that I'm I'm happy uh, Eric is back, but most of all, I am happy Meryl is back. And for, for that sake, I am happy that Judy is back as well, and uh, Maxi, which is outside. Um, so this is a picture from last year, and those... Uh, I, I want a round of applause for my front desk. Exactly. It's almost like for a minute I thought it was Maxi entering and it was just Alex. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Eric Romain. Uit Amsterdam. So, hello everyone. My name is Eric. Uh, I make apps. And I'm here to tell you about how iOS security can be super simple stuff. It's being simple, though, does not make it any less important. Because if you are not careful, hackers can turn your computer into a bomb <laughs> and, and blow your family to smithereens. Um, according to the article, an email with a special attachment will alter the molecular structure of the CPU causing it to blast apart like a large hand grenade. <laughs> and so implausible as this may sound, I start wondering every time I see the reports like this appear in the news. Uh, more seriously, there's a few common scenarios when we look at uh, iOS and security. Uh, there's attacks that you have in, in basically any kind of environment. There could be people setting up malicious web pages. They could be on the same network as you. They could be in this very room. Um, there's also, uh, especially with mobile devices which move around a lot, there's the risk of physical access. Somebody could steal your phone and try to retrieve the data from it. Last of all, there are people who use their own device for malicious purposes. They could try to circumvent uh, DRM, they could try to circumvent in-app purchases, uh, anything like that. Um, we're mostly going to focus on the first two because uh, the last one is the least interesting, basically, to protect against. The first two are, are risks that affect virtually, well, it would affect many apps. Um, so first of all, how, how secure, secure are, are you? you? Uh, does anybody here own an iOS device? <laughs> There are people in this room who do not own iOS devices. Um, for the people who use those, do you use the complex passcode? So multiple digits, more than four, only, oh, that's, that's quite a few. Anybody using standard four-digit passcodes? 
Um, is your passcode in this list? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it turns out uh, up to like 30% of all passcodes can basically be narrowed down to about 10 different ones. Uh, love is another common one, but I didn't expect that so much here. Uh, does anybody have no passcode at all? Oh, still quite a few. Um, <laughs> the, the reason this is so important is that the passcode on iOS devices is used for many of the built-in security mechanisms. Um, because the trouble with encrypting data on, on a device, whether it be uh, an iPhone or a laptop or, or basically anything, is that only part of the question is what the technology that you're using. So like Dropbox advertises, we use AES 256-bit. Uh, yes, these things are important, but they're only half the story. In any system where you encrypt data, there has to be somebody who has the key. If you don't have the key, this is a very expensive way of wiping your data. So in, in any kind of encryption, so like when data is encrypted on an iPhone, the question is, who has the keys to decrypt it? Your passcode is one of those keys for some of the data, meaning if you do not have a passcode, all the keys to decrypt all the data are probably in the device. Because if the device wouldn't know, how could it ever decrypt your data? So for example, for my laptop, which uses FileVault, the trick is not so much the technology that it uses or, or with cipher blockchaining or whatever. All these things are important. But the most important part is that the laptop does not know the key to decrypt my data. Only I know it. So if you take the laptop and you do whatever you want, it cannot decrypt the data. Um, but if I would not have a password, you could just take the data because the laptop would have to know the key. Um, it's also important to understand your risks. Um, in, for example, web applications, there are virtually always security risks involved. With apps, this can be a little different. If your app is, let's say, atomic fart, then, yeah, there's just not so much to do here. Uh, or if you make an app like cow bath, in which you have to scrub a cow. <laughs> Uh, but there are, there, are, there are more obvious examples on the other side of the spectrum, like Lock Me In, which does remote desktop, access your Mac remotely. Of course, there's a huge security component in here. If this is compromised, somebody has access to your Mac, this is obvious. But many cases are also more subtle, like the IMDB app, where you would say this is, I mean, this is all public information, which movies are, are showing, what, who's playing in them but it also contains user accounts. So that means that the IMDB app is storing usernames and passwords and transmitting them over the network. So even if it looks uh, benign, there could still be security aspects involved, but not in every single app. A most important aspect in security and building secure products is you always assume everyone is evil. Everyone is conspiring against you to compromise your app, to compromise the data of your users. So under no condition, through any way, must it be possible to somehow manipulate your app, put special input in it that would allow it to divulge data that you would not want that user to see. So users can see their own data, the app might stop functioning or like refuse to function, but in no case, you must, you must always assume that all input you get, all actions are meant to be evil. Um, so, apps typically store a lot of user data nowadays, um, so how do you actually secure that? The first feature in iOS is the sandbox, which is not something just enforced by Apple Review. This is actually enforced by the kernel, and it will kill your process if you violate the sandbox. Uh, and this limits a lot of access to files and other resources, but it does not protect everything. Uh, particularly, this does not protect against jailbroken devices. So if I jailbreak a device, which I could have stolen, for example, the sandbox does nothing. Uh, because once the device is jailbroken, you can circumvent this. Um, iPhones also apply encryption, all iOS devices do. Um, first of all, there is a install and device key on every iOS device. The device key is fused into the device. You cannot retrieve it. You can only ask it to encrypt stuff or decrypt stuff for you. 
Uh, and the important factor there is that any kind of brute forcing you do on uh, encryption on the iOS device needs to be done on the device. You cannot take the data, take the keys, and brute force it on some bigger machine. You need to do it on the device because you can't extract the device key. There's also an install key, and this is uh, basically the key that is used if you wipe the device. It basically means forget the install key and generate a new one, which instantly makes all data uh, unreadable. There are, by default, this data is all not protected with a passcode because that would mean that while booting, until you enter the passcode, the device could do nothing at all because it can't access any of your data. So by default, not all data is encrypted with the passcode, but there are APIs available for your data. Uh, Keychain is, uh, is a well-known one, also available on Mac. There's also data protection. Keychain is basically a very nice way of storing small bits of sensitive data like passwords or private keys, things like that, think up to a kilobyte or so, uh, and store them securely and fairly simply. There is a very important side to Keychain, which is the uh, Keychain uh, uh, accessibility attribute, which says under which conditions a Keychain item may be accessed. So the simplest is always uh, which just allows all access as long as you have a matching access group. Uh, there's when unlocked, which only allows access when the device is unlocked. So if you shut the device off and uh, it requires a passcode again to, to unlock, when unlocked, keychain items cannot be seen. Uh, there's after first unlock, which requires the device to be unlocked at least once, but then it can be locked again and the items are still available. And there are three similar uh, settings which require the same device. What this means, same device, basically means do not ever copy this to other iOS devices. If you restore your iOS installation on another device, items marked same device will not migrate. If you restore a backup onto the same device again, they're still there. Um, the access group on the right is uh, a special keychain uh, thing, which is the keychain access group. By default, this is your app ID, which means my app can only access keychain items made by my app. I cannot access anybody else's keychain items. The nice part here is that you can also set a different keychain access group, which uh, basically allows you to have multiple apps from the same vendor that can access each other's keychain items. So if you have multiple apps that all need to share the same login data or some other secret data, then you can set an access group. But the access group is based on your app ID prefix, which is something you cannot choose. So Apple, I have an app ID prefix. It is not possible for you to choose the same one. Therefore, you cannot be in the same keychain access group. Um, so there's, a, there's another catch. The access group is enforced through Apple's provisioning profiles. So if, my, uh, I, if I set a keychain access group of your app in my app, then uh, Apple will refuse it because it does not match with the profile for my app. Because it will compare the app ID prefix, which I cannot choose, which Apple puts in my provisioning profile, and it'll figure out they don't match. The catch here is if you jailbreak a device, Apple's certificates are no longer relevant because this is one of the points of jailbreaking, it does not matter whether Apple signed it, anything is fine, which basically reduces the access to this. Uh, the message here is never use these. Uh, there is no, there's very little point in using always or always this device only. In virtually every case, you can settle for after first unlock or after first unlock this device only. Um, because when a user reboots their phone, they typically enter their, uh, their passcode quickly after. So you can do background, just not in the small time frame between an app, a device reboot and the first time the user enters the passcode. Um, and this is so important because if you jailbreak a device or do other fancy stuff, this does typically require a real boot, a reboot. So if I take your device, want to access your keychain items, I jailbreak it, the device reboots, and suddenly all the after first unlock keychain items are inaccessible. So reboots really help here. Um, assuming, of course, you've set a passcode, because otherwise after first unlock is the same as uh, always. 
because there is no locking protection, therefore it's always available. Uh, Keychain has a fairly simple API. Uh, you create a dictionary, you set a few settings. We say it's a generic password. We have to set the account name, uh, say set the accessibility attribute, in this case only when it's unlocked, but it does migrate along to new devices. And then you set some data for the password. This can be strings, but basically any arbitrary NS data, uh, as long as it's not ridiculously large, because Keychain is not designed and will not perform well in those cases. Uh, a thing to be aware of here is that the metadata is not encrypted. So the account name that you put in here is not stored encrypted. So if that is sensitive, you might need to create two keychain items under a name that you remember in your app. Uh, there are similar access levels. So this is keychain. There are similar access levels in uh, what we typically call the data protection API, where you can do this with NS data, NS file manager, SQLite, or core data. Um, they are named differently for each of these use cases. Uh, but they basically have the same concept. You can have none, this is default. Um, you can have complete, which is basically only allow access to this file when the device is unlocked and cease the access to the file as soon as the device becomes locked. There's complete unless open, which is a special one, not available in Keychain which says um, you can continue reading the file if you have it open, but you cannot open a new file while the device is locked. So if you're reading something or writing something, and at some point the user locks the device, you can keep going, but once you close the file, you're finished. You can do nothing until the device is unlocked again. And last of all, there's complete until first user authentication, which basically maps to the same keychain option after a reboot, require the passcode to be entered once. Uh, again, don't use this. Uh, there's just very little point. Virtually all cases can use complete until first user authentication. Uh, using this is quite simple. If you get some NS data with some secret content, uh, with NS file manager, you can pass attributes. Um, for uh, if you use write to file and NS data, you can provide options, uh, and that's basically it. Uh, for SQLite, it's a little trickier because this is not actually documented. Uh, this is in a Apple Dubtop video, so it should be allowed. Uh, you can basically pass options to either SQLite directly or FMDB. Uh, this does require you to set this on every file that you manage, which stores sensitive data you can also set a default. Uh, for that, you have to create your provisioning profile, enabling data protection and the correct protection level. This also goes into your app's entitlements. And then this becomes a default. You can still override it with the options I showed before. You can determine it per file, but the default will be whatever you set here and in your matching entitlement. Uh, and as user defaults, for example, has no options and simply allows everything at any time. Um, so that's not so, uh, not so secure. Um, sometimes, though, the, the passcode on the device is not enough for you. Um, there's, uh, there's a ton of these apps uh, which will protect your pictures and uh, against prying eyes. Uh, they have their own passcode screen. This is also typical in sensitive apps like uh, Dropbox or banking apps, things like that. Um, I picked this one fairly at random and it has four and a half star average reviews. It has 100 reviews with an average of four and a half star. And uh, people say, you know, this is super, my secret photos are safe. There's even a decoy passcode and if you enter that, you get to see a different set. So you can hide everything. And it's uh, excellent for naughty pictures and you never have to worry when you leave your phone somewhere. Uh, and it's basically you enter a passcode and if you enter it correctly, it'll accept it and show you whatever secret images are in there. But if you actually look at, uh, at how the app is built, I have a iPhone 3G here, which you may remember from a long time ago. Uh, and this is jailbroken and it runs this app and I added a picture. And what happens when you log in with SSH, as you can easily do once the device is jailbroken, uh, and look around a bit in the applications. Uh, I think it's this one. So this is basically the data of the app on the device. This device is locked, 
so any data protection would have uh, not made this data available. Even through SSH, if the device is locked, data protection will prevent you from accessing the file. Uh, but if you dig around a bit um, and look around here, there's some SQLite data, there's another weirdly named directory. Then in here, there's an image. So if I just copy that image uh, to here, Which one? Uh, ah, right, right. <laughs> no, it's it's from the from the directory here. So uh, basically, you can just copy the file off, and damn it. Oh. That's it. And it'll just copy all the data. So apparently there's no data protection on this. And uh, you have the image in clear text. That's on my screen. <laughs> That's a naughty picture. But, but it's actually worse. Um, because if you look at the preferences file, you'll find that, uh, and copy that off, you'll actually find the uh, code for accessing the photos plain text in NS user defaults. So the downside here is all these users are happy, but they have no idea how crappy this app is. And this is actually surprisingly common. I found a few other apps that store passwords in NS user defaults. Um, Keychain is fairly well known, but especially data protection, I find basically almost nowhere. How would you do this properly? Um, so that's, it's a little involved to do this. But it's doable because there's a lot of help iOS gives you with this. So the proper way, if I were to make an app that requires a custom passcode to decode some data, the proper way would be to actually use that passcode to encrypt the data, which means my app doesn't actually know the passcode. And only when a user comes along with the correct passcode, we can decrypt the data, which is much how Keychain works. So Keychain, the Keychain on the device, is not actually able to decrypt the data because only I know the key when I enter it. But you can do this yourself um, with the APIs offered in iOS. Basically, you have your user enter a passcode or a password. Um, and this is typically where it goes wrong. Then somebody says, we'll use that as the encryption key, uh, which would work, but it's wrong. The right way to do this is to generate an encryption key with a function like uh, pbkdf2. Uh, you feed it to the password and a random value. Um, what it is doesn't matter, it has to be random, you have to remember it. Uh, and the purpose of this is that it generates an encryption key based on your password. It's slightly different every time you have a different salt, and the most important part is that this is really, really slow. So we're talking like 50 milliseconds or maybe like 100 milliseconds. And this is really, really slow because password hashing is sometimes incorrectly done with hashes like uh, SHA1 or MD5. Um, the trouble is that these are really fast. They're meant to be fast. That's the whole point. Whereas in this case, the point of it being slow is that the user doesn't notice a 100 millisecond delay for generating the key. However, if I have to try out hundreds of thousands of possible passcodes to brute force this data, then suddenly 100 milliseconds versus one millisecond is really a massive difference. So the idea here is a user entering a passcode does not notice that it's slow, but if you have to brute force everything, then this really is, becomes annoying. So once you have your encryption key, you uh, have to take another va random value. It's called the IV, the initialization vector. It just has to be random. You have to remember it. Uh, you should use AES. And then you remember the IV and salt you generated. You need those values when you decrypt. You forget the password. That's the whole point. Do not remember the password because the whole idea is that only when a user feeds the right password into this, we can decrypt the data. So as long as the user doesn't tell anybody their password, their data is safe. Uh, this may sound complex, but all this is in standard APIs. Uh, iOS has PBKDF2 built in. Uh, it has, the security framework has functions to generate secure random data, uh, and AES, of course. 
Uh, one particular note here is check the error conditions of everything you do here. Uh, I just saw something come by about uh, some commonly used example where actually the key would be all zeros. So the function would return an error, but uh, the example ignored that key would be all zeros, and that makes it rather easy to crack. Um, so that's, that's, that's storing the user's data. Another common aspect in iOS apps are API calls, so calls to remote systems. They might be yours, they might be someone else's. Again, remember, all our users are evil. Um, your API, even if it is private, is not invisible. You, someone can reverse engineer your API to find it. So just because you haven't made your API a public service doesn't mean uh, there won't be anyone with malicious intent accessing it. So uh, the details of this are out of scope, but basically your API has to be secure itself as well. Um, the most important rule for APIs is always use TLS or SSL. Uh, TLS is basically a new version of SSL, but SSL is more commonly used in conversation. Uh, because if you do not do this, even the most simple interception, passively listening to network traffic, uh, which is, for example, trivial on open Wi-Fi networks, that's just possible. As soon as you use uh, uh, SSL, you can no longer work with passive interception. Uh, cheap certificates for your SSL are completely fine. More expensive certificates are not more secure. Uh, even free ones are fine. And if you really want the validation tighter, you can use uh, SSL pinning, which, uh, which we'll go into. But first, it's important to understand why we are using TLS and SSL. Um, the most obvious and well-known function is that we encrypt the traffic. So somebody listening in on the data is not able to decode it because they only get encrypted data. But the other part, which is just as important, is verifying the identity of the server. Because there's not a lot of point in setting up a fancy encrypted connection with someone if you don't know whether that's the person you intended to reach. Maybe it's actually me, and I'm passing the data onto the real target of your, uh, of your requests, and basically I'm a man in the middle, and you wouldn't know because you haven't checked who I am. You've just said, is this connection encrypted? Yes, fine. So verifying the identity of the server is as important uh, as SSL itself. Uh, fortunately, this is very simple. Uh, the way it works, the way iOS knows whether I am the legitimate owner of a certificate is through certificate authorities. So iOS and macOS and Firefox and uh, all these things come with a built-in list of people we trust at telling which other people, uh, which people are who. So Safari, for example, uses the built-in iOS uh, certificate list and there's somebody in there called Ad Trust. And apparently we trust these people at telling us who other people are. Uh, there's typically another certificate in between. Uh, so basically, iOS trusts the certificate on the left, which then says, actually, you should trust the certificate on the right, which might then say, actually, you should trust the certificate on the right. And so basically what you get here is a chain of trust because iOS trusts the first one that basically flows down and in the end, we know that uh, that certificate is really belonging to api.example.com. Uh, sometimes this goes wrong and certificate authorities, which are commonly in everyone's operating systems, will sign certificates without verifying who the owners of the domain. Uh, this happened to a Dutch one uh, a few, last year. Uh, they went bankrupt within two weeks and were very quickly removed from all operating systems. But typically this is, this is a very reliable way of doing this. So it's quite hard to get a valid certificate through this that's validated through this chain of trust for a domain that you don't own. The trick here though is that there are many certificates that iOS will trust and that, uh, uh, and macOS and Firefox. So another option that is sometimes done is that uh, you only trust your own certificate. This is called SSL certificate pinning. Uh, and you could configure it as saying my app only trusts that specific certificate, more secure would be to generate your own certificate authority, so a certificate which is allowed to sign other certificates. Uh, the upside here is that uh, 
the certificates for that in the end running on your server are typically more distributed. They're available on the server, which is online on the internet, your own certificate authority, you could keep a bit more protected. And you could also sign your development server and other things. Um, there is a very dangerous downside to this. If you deploy this, the uh, App Store app does actually do this, uh, and you lose your own certificate authority, uh, there is no recovery. Uh, basically, it means that if you lose these certificates, then uh, you can, all your users, uh, their app will suddenly break. There is no recovery. The only way to recover from that is to send them all an update. So if you do this and you lose your certificate, that's the end. Basically, all your users, their connections will break instantly and you cannot recover them. Whereas if you use a normal certificate authority, you could just buy a certificate somewhere else and replace it. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend this. It is a practice that some apps do. Um, I'm not sure where the balance is. If you, I'd say if you're not sure, stick to the default. So the default is very simple. Uh, all you have to do is say to uh, NS uh, URL connection, um, use HTTPS. That's all there's to it. By default, it will go through the whole certificate chain. And, and refuse any certificate which doesn't validate. Uh, you can change this behavior by overriding uh, will send request for authentication challenge. What you could do here, for example, uh, in the link in the bottom, there's an example to do your custom SSL pinning. What you can also do is just say, sure, just accept anything. Uh, some apps do this. It's pretty rare because the default is safe. Uh, it does happen. This is very bad because yeah, you're basically allowing man in the middle. If you start messing around with this, do make sure you test thoroughly that not only the certificate you expect to be okay is okay, but that also a certificate which should not be accepted is actually being refused. Uh, also, I recommend not doing this for your development setup uh, because it's very simple to say for development we accept every certificate and then accidentally deploy that in production. So certificates are very cheap. They can be as simple as 10 euro per year. So just buy one for development as well. Uh, so an example of probably where exactly this went wrong is uh, uh, the ING app. ING is one of the largest banks in the Netherlands. Uh, and they basically had uh, this hole for months where they would accept any SSL certificate, which actually made them less secure than if they would just not have touched it. Uh, which is just, yeah, if you're a bank, you should have known. So inter-app communication. Um, we don't have a lot of this, but we have some in iOS. Um, most well known is probably URL schemes. So I can register for a URL scheme uh, and every call to that URL scheme will be sent to my app and I can do fancy things with, uh, with the URLs. So for example, Twitter uses this so that I can call a URL from my app and Twitter will pop up with a new tweet or showing a tweet that I linked from somewhere else. So this is very convenient. Uh, Skype also supports this, so you can uh, call, a, basically have the user call a Skype number from inside your own app. Uh, the tricky part here though is that this doesn't even have to be an app, it could also be an iframe on a website because they can also open URLs. Um, so this was actually vulnerability in Skype, it has been fixed since now. Basically what you could do is have a uh, iPhone user visit a website with a URL like this. So you would have Skype call a premium number um, and the, the Safari would see this, would open the URL, Skype would open up and would call the number and I would get paid and you would be too late to do anything. So nowadays Skype does this correctly and it would say, do you actually want to place this call? So the important part here is the person who is sending a message through a URL scheme may not have, uh, may try to do something malicious, may try to trick the user into doing something that they did not intend to do. Uh, the other side is not much better. If more than one third party app registers to handle the same URL scheme, there is no process for determining which app will be given that scheme. In other words, if you send some data through a URL scheme, you do not know who the receiver is. Even if you know your other app is on that device, that might not actually be the receiver. And I would not trust Apple Review to catch this. 
So custom URL schemes are nice, but they are not fully reliable because the person, the, the app that is calling your URL scheme may be doing that with some malicious intent and you don't know who the receiver is going to be of a URL scheme. Uh, another trick is uh, private pasteboards. So iOS has the public pasteboard, which uh, by the way, also any app can access at any time, not just when the user presses paste, but even without the user's involvement. You can have private pasteboards uh, which are identified by name and you could use that to transfer data. Never do this. Sorry? Oh, that's good, that's great. Uh, because private pasteboards are not actually private, this is a complete misnomer. So first of all, the normal pasteboard is always accessible. Or was that what you were saying about iOS 7? iOS 7 uh, shared pasteboards can only be used inside the app sandbox. Cool, that's, that's a good improvement. Because yeah, basically the thing is that the pasteboard isn't private. If I write an app that accesses your pasteboard name, I have the data. Uh, the only real proper option if you want to exchange sensitive data between your different apps is put it in Keychain, use the Keychain group. That is the proper secure option. Um, so then there's background snapshots. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen the new iOS 7 app switcher, which, uh, which shows much bigger screenshots instead of just icons. Uh, this also already existed in iOS 6 in a way and older because when your app would go to the background, the OS would make a screenshot of what your app looks like. As soon as your app is reactivated, uh, the screenshot is first shown and then your app actually loads, which adds to the perception of speed. So this is very nice uh, and it's fine for apps like this because yeah, someone else might see how many points I have to get. I did actually beat that score. But for apps which contain a lot of sensitive data, this is not acceptable. Uh, especially those which are usually protected by a passcode, you do not want your screenshots to reveal any data. So what you typically see is that apps like banking or Dropbox uh, will not allow their screenshot to contain any data. This is really simple. Uh, you can intercept uh, application did enter background either in your app delegate or through NS notification center. And at that point you have some time to basically do anything you want to the screen. You could put an overlay image like Dropbox does. You could also remove certain details, but basically to make sure that after that, this, the app is safe to make a screenshot of, that there is no sensitive data at all in the screenshot. If you're testing this in iOS 7 on the simulator, it will not work. So try it on the device and it will work. Mm. So just so you know and just don't lose time on trying to debug that. Uh, does anybody here use NSLock? Uh, has anybody ever used NSLog in a shipped application? <laughs> I, I, I've even done it once. Um, the thing about NSLog is that, um, at least in iOS 6 and lower, this is public. Any app can access any NSLog entries. Uh, there's, for example, an app called System Console, which is in the App Store, so approved by Apple which uses the Apple system log facility or something like that to access logs, for example, here of the mobile phone app. Um, which means that if you log any sensitive data or actually anything at all, that is public information for any app that runs on the device. Uh, particularly tracking uh, libraries are uh, log a lot of stuff like this, like Flickr logging all sorts of hashes about my device. I don't know what they actually are, a Yahoo user hash. I don't know whether it's sensitive. Uh, PayPal, which becomes very verbose if you enter an incorrect password. The incorrect password isn't actually in here. Uh, Airbnb also uses some uh, tracking framework, which is very noisy, uh, logging all sorts of IDs when I exactly installed the app. And even though there are no extremely sensitive stuff in here, like there's no password, my location isn't in there, this is just not a good practice. Um, this might have changed in iOS 7. The app I just referred to doesn't work. Maybe there's still another way to work around this. But yeah, basically don't NSLog anything in production. Why would you? Then there's a SQLite injection. Does any Actually, if you use Crashlytics, I don't know if anyone uses Crashlytics, but you should. 
Um, uh, you can actually use CLS log, I guess, which um, uh, differentiate between a debug, debug build, build and a, a normal build, and you can, yeah, you don't have to do anything about that. Logging breakpoints or get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you use things like raw SQLite, um, there is the risk, like in web applications, of SQL injection, like this statement, uh, which uh, uses string, uh, string formatting to insert a keyword into a SQL query. This is vulnerable to SQL injection, because if the keyword contains, uh, if I construct the keyword properly, I can execute arbitrary queries on this database. Um, how do you fix this? You use prepared statements, like everyone has done in web applications, I hope, since ages. You may argue that SQLite databases on the device are probably not so sensitive because they probably only contain data about the user that is using the device, therefore the legitimate owner of the data. Um, but keep it super simple and just don't think about whether or not this is sensitive, just do the proper thing. Um, this also goes for data protection, for example. Um, there is, instead of thinking carefully like, you know, what could go wrong, do we really need data protection? Data protection is painless, so just enable it and it'll be super simple. Uh, a few other things. Um, Apple has this in their uh, iTunes Connect FAQ. Is your product designed to use cryptography or does it contain or incorporate? Answer yes, even if your app only uses or accesses encryption from iOS, uh, which may also include just doing an HTTPS call. This is about export compliance. Uh, this is a question which you've all seen pass by if you uh, uh, submit an app. Does your app contain encryption? If so, is the, app, is the encryption only for authentication? Questions like that. The basic conclusion is if you use encryption, uh, in many cases, according to iTunes, you have to file a encryption registration notification through a portal called Snapper and so on. It's a lot of, um, yeah, useless paperwork, basically. It's not so hard. I haven't gone through the process myself. I should also say I'm not an export compliance lawyer, uh, but I thought you should be aware of it in case you do uh, use things like your own encryption, in case you do HPS, that this may be something you need to look into, uh, maybe with someone who knows more about it. Um, don't forget to watch your caches. Uh, Citibank had uh, a while ago a security flaw which sounds a lot like a caching problem, basically caching data and then not securing it properly. So you could uh, store all the passwords in Keychain and it'll be all nice and fancy and the proper accessibility attribute. But if you then take some of the data and cache it locally on the device and don't protect it, there's very little point because if somebody can access the cached data, then uh, yeah, that sort of defeats the point. Um, I have a nicer example of caching and security, but they asked me not to disclose it until it's fixed, so that's a shame. Um, for binaries, remember that, uh, of course, signing only allows authorized code, but this is avoidable by doing a jailbreak. It's the whole point of a jailbreak. Um, the binary that you get from the App Store is encrypted, but uh, you can extract a decrypted binary from an iOS device because the binary is encrypted, the iPhone is going to run it, therefore the iPhone must have the decryption key, otherwise it could not run it. It is a little involved, it's not very simple, you need to be jailbroken, but it's definitely not impossible. Uh, also be careful with autocorrect, autocorrect keeps a cache of entered words, um, password fields by default already disable autocorrect as they should, but if you have other fields that have very sensitive data, disable autocorrect. Uh, probably autocorrect won't be useful for them anyway, so you're not harming the user either. A few other things that you might want to look at if you, uh, if you want to read more. Uh, Apple Documents, their uh, iOS security uh, setup, which details all the keys and all the files and accessibility levels and which keys are used at which point and deleted where and stored where uh, in, in very great detail. Uh, there's the SSL pinning example that I already mentioned, a nice example on how you use AES encryption with the uh, security framework and using the proper uh, key handling uh, and uh, a favorite which goes into all of these things so much deeper is uh, iOS application insecurity 
a nice paper which will detail like how do you actually extract a binary decrypted from an iOS device, uh, how do you avoid someone else's jailbreak detection, how do you avoid people's tamper detection, and uh, fancy things like that. Um, and I know that some of this stuff can be a little daunting, like especially in data protection where you have like you could sort with NS data, NS file manager, SQLite core data, or keychain, and each of them has a different set of accessibility attributes, which are slightly differently named, which you have to set slightly differently. Um, and this annoyed me as well, so I started working on how to store iosdata.com, which uh, will take you through a few basic questions like, I want to store my data in NS user defaults, I do not need to share it, I need to use it, I do not need background features, therefore you should store it with this level in this type of data, and here's a code sample on how to do that. Uh, it's still in an early stage, uh, the basics work. Uh, uh, I want to continue working on this on the hack day to expand it more to have better code samples uh, and uh, maybe cover other things from the security angle to basically make it simple for anybody to understand any of these things meaning that more developers will use these security techniques in their apps. Um, so if you're interested in joining on that, join me on the hack day and, uh, and so we can make much more of it. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So I have one word for this talk, which is wow. Um, that was awesome. I'm sure you guys have tons of questions. I, I do. Keep them for the panel because we're seriously running out of time. Um, we're going to do like a five minute quick uh, break now and in five minutes we'll be back with Rainer. Round of applause again. <laughs> I've only ever seen one better security presentation, and that was at Apple by Quinn. So nice. There's no beating that. Other than that, that was fantastic. Cool. Oh. I'm gonna hit you up later. Nice talk. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome talk. I'm gonna set you up already with a microphone. Yeah. Let's, let's um, do it. I have your talk, which is already good.